Kevin, what are some of the processes that businesses use to identify energy improvements that they could make? Well, ideas can come from a wide range of sources. Um, some might seem obvious, uh, but if we only do the obvious, we might be missing some great opportunities. Uh, the approach can be quite informal, such as using your own experience and those of other people that you work with, or it might be quite structured and formal, uh, and you might even have to use intensive data analysis. Once you start looking, some things will be really obvious, such as turning off equipment which is not being used, uh, and obviously if they're turned off, they will use less energy. Um, one of the key lean concepts is that people at the work phase who are most aware of the problems and are therefore best suited to propose a solution. And so a key source of energy improvement ideas is the people who work in the area and who use the equipment. Um, people at the coal face of day-to-day -day operations often know if equipment is on all day. Um, but only used for some of the time. They'll often have a good handle on how to schedule the use of it to best reflect its demand. Uh, they might also know where, for example, compressed air is leaking out because they hear it hissing, or equipment that's making funny noises, uh, which is normally a sign that uh, something needs doing to it. So talking to people in the business is a simple and cheap source of ideas and something that should be happening anyway. And also, talking to employees often has other benefits, so they feel valued, they get more motivated, um, and it is a great way of helping to pick some of the low-hanging fruit. Can you give us some examples of what would be considered low-hanging fruit? Well, low-hanging fruit is one of these handy terms. It refers to things that are pretty obvious, relatively easy to do, uh, fairly easy to uh, implement, fairly cheap often. And typically these are done early in the energy efficiency process. And so they can deliver a really good bang for buck because the starting point is so low. Um, could be things like fixing seals on windows so the heat from your air conditioner isn't going straight out the window. Um, or another business told us about fixing leaks in compressed air lines. Uh, that saves them $2,000 a year uh, off their energy costs. Louise, what were some of the low hanging fruit for Focus Press? One of our most successful early energy efficiency measures was modifying our office windows. So previously the windows were sealed shut so that the air conditioning was used almost all year round and was on high right throughout the summer. So the windows were an obvious first project for us as we would often have preferred to open them than to turn on the air conditioning. And we also hoped that by modifying them we would be able to achieve some significant savings without the need for high tech equipment. We altered the windows so that we could open them and had them coated in a UV and heat reflecting coating. And these simple measures were enough to restrict our air conditioning use to the summer months and to reduce our energy use by 30%. Other measures included installing software to shut down our PCs overnight and removing most of our desk based PCs in favour of more mobile laptops. Since laptops were taken home most evenings, they were guaranteed to be turned off rather than the PCs, which are often left on standby. So these ideas might come from anyone in the business and people might have different motivations for thinking about energy efficiency. One business we talked to, they told us about promoting the personal benefits because some energy improvements can make the person's own job easier or more comfortable. For example, one area might be too hot and wasting heat, or there was the situation where the staff suggested to put the kettle and the staff room air conditioning on a timer to start five minutes before break time and then turn off again, and this made their breaks much more pleasant. Louise, you had heaps of suggestions from staff, so how did you go about motivating them to contribute? Well, our sustainability committees have always been central to our energy efficiency strategy. We have one committee at each site who meet on a monthly basis to oversee current projects and plan and implement new projects. The committees are open to all staff, however staff who are not committee members can still contribute to ideas and feedback by passing them on to a committee member to bring up at the next meeting. We have found that by being involved in these committees, staff can have more input initiating and sharing new ideas and to be part of the decision making and implementation processes. The engagement really helps to motivate them as they can see the impacts of their ideas and be part of changing how things are done across the various sites. We also recognise the contribution of staff members in our quarterly newsletters and through an annual award for the best energy savings idea. 
Newsletters are distributed to all staff and we find that they are a good way to share information and to keep everyone informed about what's going on around the various sites. The awards are run at the end of each year and are judged by our senior management team and the team reviews all the ideas and subsequent outcomes for each energy and resource savings idea that has been put through our committees and they choose one from each site as the winner each year. Kevin, you said that data analysis was another key source of improvement ideas. Yes, people have a lot of good ideas, but this is limited by their knowledge and experience. So that's one extreme. At the other extreme, intensive data analysis can show up things that no one's thought of, or things that are obvious from the numbers, but not from the day-to-day -day activities. Um, not everybody has the expertise in-house for this. Sometimes you need to call in an external consultant. Data is used to identify areas with high energy use, low energy efficiency. Once you've identified these areas, you can then go searching for the causes of the low efficiency in those areas. Uh, it's possible, of course, to improve the energy efficiency in all areas, but if we focus just on the big ones, uh, which are inefficient, then it's going to bring us a lot more return from our investment. There is a video on how to do this called Energy Efficiency Sources of Data. And we also look at measuring and estimating energy use in more detail in other webinars. So just to take an overview, how does this give us ideas and options? Well, we might start off with the total amount of waste and progressively narrow this down. And then we keep narrowing it down until we've just got one or two areas. So we start with total energy bills, for example. It tells us how much energy we use, but not much else, other than, of course, the cost. At this broad level, uh, you might identify consumption and get some ideas of overall efficiency, uh, which is just consumption divided by output, but have a little idea of what happens in each area. So you can then drill down, um, get into more detail, identifying the consumption by each area or by each process, uh, and you can do this by data logging or by calculation. And this greater level of data then starts showing up which areas have the higher waste. And so in this example we see here, obviously we start looking hard at step number two. Well, um, ways you could do this, you might just simply keep a logbook. Uh, one business kept logbooks for its forklift trucks and discovered that one forklift truck used about three times as much LPG as the others. They had it fixed and dramatically reduced their overall LPG bill. Another used data logging and found which areas had a high use and so which areas should be the focus for energy efficiency. Um, you might look at process operating hours versus equipment operating hours. One business did this and found they had a large compressor running 24 hours a day, whereas on night shift they only needed a small amount of air, and so they bought a second small compressor which only ran on a night shift, and they now shut down the big compressor for the night shift. Sure, there was a cash outlay for the new compressor, but the payback period from the energy saving was only six months, and so it was well worth doing. Or maybe you go down the path of, of data logging. Um, he, one company put data loggers um, onto their conveyor belts. Um, what they found here was that so these were then giving them a, a really good feel on the amount of data that each process was using, and so they could then identify which were the areas uh, of high consumption. But typically here the 80-20 rule applies. We, c we can expect something like 80% of our losses from 20% of our processes. So if we can identify that 20%, it gives us better bang for our buck. Um, and so going back to our conveyor belt company, the data loggers then enabled the operators to read off the current draw. They told the operators if it's drawing current above a certain amount, report this to maintenance. Maintenance then came, lubricated the conveyor, and this simple tactic saved them a lot of money. Or you might do an energy balance over the entire process. Calculate your total waste. You might then do another energy balance over half the process to determine which half has the greater waste, and continue this approach progressively over smaller portions of the process until those few processes which make the largest contribution to your waste have been identified. Again, this is the 80-20 rule. And again, more about this in another webinar, identifying energy use. 
So Kevin, the energy efficiency skill sets refer to sustainability issues, sensitivities, interactions and impacts. And these can help a business to select and prioritise their sustainability activities. But they all sound pretty much the same. So can you explain how they differ? Okay, let's start with sustainability issues. Now to some extent, these are the same for all of us. We need to make enough profit to stay in business and hopefully prosper. We don't want to degrade the environment and we want to use all resources as efficiently as possible. We also want to foster positive relationships with workers, with the local community, and generally be a good corporate citizen. However, while this is generally true for all businesses, each business will also have its own emphasis, which grows from the unique interactions each business has with the environment, the community, and its commercial setting. It also flows from the individual commitments of the organisation's CEO and senior management. And each interaction can be coloured by perceptions and interpretations, which are often based on things like personal values, media information or misinformation, current hotspots, politics, and the like. All organisations and all processes in the value chain have economic, ecological, and social interactions. All processes draw resources from the environment and then put waste back into the environment. All processes involve people who come from and live in the society. And all of these have economic costs and benefits. These are the interactions which each organisation has. Defining these interactions helps us understand how the individual organisation and each step in that organisation's value chain fits within the greater web which is the society within which we all live and work. Each interaction will also have an impact. Let's look at some examples to help us understand this concept. A process might bring in water and then use it in some process and then dispose of it. So the water might come from town water supply, oh, it's piped in, might come from rainwater tanks, might be groundwater, oh, I come from a well or a bore. The processes we might use them, we might use it for cooling so the water gets heated but otherwise unchanged. Uh, we might use it for dyeing fabrics which will then leave a range of chemicals in the wastewater. Or maybe we use the water for staff amenities which includes toilet flushing. Then disposal. How do we get rid of it? Well, we could put it down the sewer which includes trade waste. Uh, we could dispose it in the local waterway or a local wetland. Or we could put it through some internal treatment plant and then use it to irrigate a local sporting field. The impacts then will depend on the specific combination of these interactions. So let's look at a couple of possible combinations. The water is used in a heat exchanger and the warm water is discharged to the local waterway. This will increase the temperature, which in turn will reduce the solubility of oxygen in the water and so make it more likely the receiving water wire will become stagnant. If on the other hand the water is disposed of by irrigation of the local sporting field, this may have beneficial impacts for the local community and will reduce the water which the sporting field needs to source from somewhere else. However, if the water comes from staff amenities, you will need sanitising before release. And even so, if the publicity is not handled properly, the local community may feel there's a health risk, even if there isn't one from sanitised water. So defining and understanding our interactions allow us to define the impacts we have on our environment, the society and the organisation's profit. In turn, this helps us focus our effort in areas which will achieve the maximum benefit. As we progress with sustainability, we can use this understanding to guide our activities rather than just responding to the legacy that we inherited. So something has changed and that has an impact on the environment or the community, so surely that will be a sensitivity? Well, not always. Sensitivities can change as conditions change. So to go back to our example, the water we're seeing to irrigate the field, we said that was a positive. But say we have a really wet season and our water is now adding to flooding of the sports field. Yeah, not quite so good. Or maybe the business has bad press for leaking some chemicals to the air. Now these are not contaminating the water in any way, but who's going to trust us? So suddenly we might have a sensitivity. If we're disposing of the waste water to the local wetlands, this may well be a significant sensitivity, even if the water is clean because any disposal of wetlands may be seen as altering the ecological balance. So in this scenario, we might have our analysis of energy use 
find that we can make great savings our energy use and so also reduce our ecological impact by using less energy. But because of the sensitivity associated with our disposal of clean but warm water to the local wetlands, we may decide that our priority is to deal with this issue, and we might do that by disposing of it as trade waste, before we focus on energy savings. So sensitivities are quite idiosyncratic and typically arise directly from an organisation's interactions with the community and environment, both locally and more widely and the impacts that arise from those interactions. There are different systems for identifying and managing environmental risk, which of course includes energy issues, and these can also be a source of improvement ideas. ISO 14001 is the International Standard for Environmental Management Systems, or EMS in shorthand. Uh, this is a voluntary standard and it provides a structure and guidance for setting up an environmental management system. Um, businesses can use this as a guide, either with or without the formal ISO certification. We'll pick up part of a video where Louise, our guest today, and her managing director, David Fuller, are explaining how Focus Press set up their EMS, and this gives us a good introduction. Video there. Technical hitch. An environmental management system takes a risk management approach. The first step involves looking at the business's environmental impacts, both directly through its day-to-day -day activities and indirectly through the value chain of producing your service or product. The first step in setting up our EMS was looking at what are the aspects and impacts of our operations. And what that basically means is just looking at every possible way that we either impact the environment or may impact the environment. Impacting the environment comes down to our waste to landfill, our electricity use, our water use. We managed to get a consultant that did ISO 14000. He took us off site for two days and we created a register of what we did and we called that aspects and impacts. And then the register pretty much listed every single thing we did. So the, the process of ISO 14000 is very important to us in establishing a baseline where we could create a hierarchy of, of our aspects and impact and know that the top of the hierarchy was what we had to get rid of and work on continuously. It gave us something to focus on. Louise, I'm wondering if you could tell us what processes you use to identify these aspect aspects and impacts and what did you find within the value chain? One of the first actions we took when we were designing our EMS was to take a group of our staff off site for a couple of days to look at our aspects and impacts. We decided to approach this as a group activity so that we would have a broad range of perspectives about what should be included in the EMS and also to engage our staff early on in the process. We hope that this would help them understand and thus buy into the EMS, EMS process and our resulting management systems. Together as a group, we analysed each unit of our manufacturing operations, such as pre-press, the press room, dispatch and office areas, and brainstormed all the possible environmental impacts and aspects associated with each area. We had butcher's paper up on the walls and post-it notes to record suggestions as they arose. Once we had finished brainstorming, we categorised each aspect and ranked its potential impact according to a risk matrix that took into account the likelihood of the hazard occurring and the potential effect that it did if it did occur. And you can see on the screen here a risk matrix that's similar to the one that we used. The number scale or the impact categories are not important. The, the main thing here is to be able to rank your risk consistently and in a way that everyone understands. So at the end of the process, we had a comprehensive list of environmental impacts and aspects organised by operation and ranked by severity that we used by our staff, understood by our staff and relevant to all areas of our operations. And interestingly enough, energy use came up as a medium to high risk in different parts of the business, mainly due to the predicted increases in energy prices in coming years. So we now review this list annually as part of our EMS audit process. So at each review, we go through the list, we eliminate aspects which are no longer relevant to our operations, such as if we're no longer using a certain chemical, and add any new ones that have arisen in the past year. We also set targets for reducing our impacts and review them each year. 
So on the screen now you can see the review of our targets from last year. We saw before that a sensitivity might make something a high priority, but there are different pr approaches to prioritising and deciding which energy efficiency improvements to do first. Louise, what sort of things were at the top of your hierarchy and how did they get there? Aspects with the greatest potential impacts were at the top of the list. So these were generally things that were unlikely to occur but would have had a major impact if they did occur, such as chemical spills or incorrect disposal of controlled waste streams. And so we identified the potential severity of these aspects via the risk ranking project that I mentioned earlier on. And so once we had a complete list, we addressed the impacts with the highest severity ranking first, either to eliminate them if possible or to put policies and procedures in place to minimise the risk. Yes, this is a traditional risk management approach uh, where you try to eliminate or minimise the risk and to mitigate or remediate any negative impacts. Um, we've applied this here to energy and with energy you typically can't eliminate the risk altogether because you can't function without the energy. But you might use a system which is similar to what is used on waste management. The hierarchy of waste management is of course reduce, reuse and recycle. If we're applying this in the field of uh, energy waste reduction, again we might talk about a similar hierarchy of reduce, where reducing is about minimising energy use or optimising energy use. Reuse is about capturing of waste heat. And rather than uh, reuse, we talk about the use of renewables. And so where practical, we source renewable energy, uh, either by specifying green power from our electricity provider or maybe we install solar electricity or solar water heating. We've discussed reusing waste heat more fully in another webinar and this is now available at the energy trading video from the sustainabilityskills.net.au website. Reducing energy use is about using it more efficiently and this is also discussed more fully in another video. Louise, once your high risk things were dealt with, what other factors did you consider in prioritising for the big improvements? Productivity has always been a measure that we've tried to include in our decision making. Um, and a good example of this recently is where we were looking to replace two older presses with a newer, more integrated model. However, the newer press used more energy than the two older presses combined. However, a pilot study indicated that it had a much higher processing output. And this gave it a lower energy intensity or energy use per unit of output. So when we consider the productivity of the equipment, in addition to the energy use, the newer model came out on top. Safety is also often a key aspect that we have needed to consider in our decision making. For example, we recently upgraded the lighting in a section of one of our factories. For parts of the factory that are not used very often, the most energy efficient option was to install sensor lights that would only turn on when the area was being used. However, given the factory environment, there's a considerable WHF hazard associated with dark or dimly lit areas. And this would occur if the sensory mechanism failed to switch on the lights when required. And so for this reason, we decided to stick with lights that would be on at all times, even though they would use more energy than the sensor lights. Carbon emissions are another consideration for us and required a closer look at where the emissions were coming from. For example, when we compared the carbon emissions associated with either gas or electric forklifts, we initially thought that there would be little difference. However, once we looked into how the fuel was packaged and transported, such as into gas bottles and brought to our facilities, we found that the gas forklifts emit many more carbon emissions overall than the electric forklifts. We've covered a lot of ground here with four sources of ideas, different ways that a business might identify options for energy improvement. We've looked at drawing on the knowledge and experience of people in the business, analysing data, being aware of the sensitivities and hotspots that might take on a special me meaning and also systematic analysis of operations using things like an environmental management system. These are not mutually ex exclusive of course and in fact they complement each other so often a business will use all of them.